I was in school until I was 26. So that, and that was sort of three phases. I started with the public schools, and then I, I undergrad, and then went to, uh, to seminary, where I did obtain the most pompous of all degrees, a master of the divine. I still just can't say that with a straight face. But what I realized was the more I wanted to be in school, the less I actually got of it. Like, if you remember, in, when you're in high school, how long is Christmas break? About a week and a half, right? Ish. What was it here? Two, two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. Excellent. Two, two weeks. And those two weeks go by like that, and then you have to go back to the never-ending drudgery of the spring. At least that's why I remember it feeling like. And then I got to undergrad college, where I was actually enjoying some of the things I, I was doing and playing in the jazz band. Learned some. There were some interesting classes I was actually enjoying. And, and the Christmas break got longer. A lot longer. And then I went to seminary. And when you're going to seminary, like, every class matters. Because you, you really understand, like, if you get another session with this amazing professor who has spent their entire life studying scripture, that means you will understand scripture better. And you need that. And the Christmas break got even longer. And I found myself wondering, you know, I, I, like, I had scholarships for undergrad, and that was nice. There aren't any really scholarships for going to Duke for seminary. I am paying a lot of money for these classes. Can't you come back a week earlier? I, I have more I want to learn from you, right? And, and so everyone, ha you're approaching these classes with this opinion, like, I am here for a reason, and I need this. Like, I still use my notes from seminary on a regular basis. And so everyone is very focused in class, and everyone's paying attention, and in three and a half years, someone interrupted the professor one time, one time ever, in every single class. Here is the only time someone had the guts to interrupt a professor and interrupt, like, because we have to get all this information in. And here's when it happened. Uh, Dr. Steinmetz was teaching us about the history of the church, which is very applicable because there aren't any new ways to be wrong. There are old ways to be wrong with new names. And, um, and, and so he wheels, you know those uh, things, that you have the, the handles on them and there's like the seat right there and you can sit on if you get tired. And so he, he has been teaching for twice as long as I've been alive at this point. And so he wheels in on his little cart, and he's not sitting on it, because he just has his tomes of, of, of I, don't, I never saw him reach for them, but he always had like six different tomes. And, and he would, he would t turn to the class, put the notes on the lectern that he never looked at, uh, and he would start telling the stories in this deep, slow, graveling voice. And uh, he got to the point where he's talking about, uh, in church history, where we started arguing, arguing in the Reformation about predestination. This idea that everything has been set since the beginning of time. Everything that ever will happen and ever has happened has already been determined, predestined by God. And, uh, and he pauses and he says, this topic always seems to bother people more than any other topic. Even though every Christian from the first, the first millennia believed in predestination, and it, it, it's, 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 it's explaining this, and in the middle of it, a woman just exclaims, if predestination is true, what's the point? And he stops, and he sort of raises his eyebrow at the class as if to say, see, there's always someone who's really bothered by this, and then he moves on. And he keeps on teaching. But that, that's it. Like that, of all the things we, I was taught in seminary, that is the one thing that led a student to like exclaim predestination. That, that's what got under someone's skin. 
It's a very uh, simple idea that um, God has determined everything already from the beginning of time, that the fact I'm wearing these socks was determined by the fact that they fell on my head. My sock thing fell on me this morning, and so I, I grabbed the first one, put them on, I have some socks to clean up. The point being, like, that was predetermined from the beginning of time that I'd be wearing these socks, as with every other event that ever has or ever will happen, every good thing, every bad thing every life death recovery sickness right and so that's what we're looking at today and i've intentionally saved predestination to last we've been looking at these terms the language of our faith grace uh the giftedness of god the redemption and salvation our redemption is jesus paying the price and it happened two thousand years ago and salvation is the process of being healed day by day that comes from it bless and curse that to bless is to turn towards god's will and the curse is to to turn away as we've been going through these terms i have saved this one for last because this is the one that's most likely to bother you i want to sort of build up to it i guess predestination though this idea that god has a plan and, and everything you've heard it this the way this is explained is a phrase you've heard many times everything happens for a reason Right, you've heard that. Everything happens for a reason, and the reason is that God has a plan, and what hap just happened, no matter what it is, is part of God's plan. So I want to talk, we can talk about this in two different ways. And the first way to talk about it is that you pull out your bulletin and you look at the front of it, and there's a Venn diagram there. Good, fast, and cheap. Let's talk about eating out. If you're in Colombia and you have all the options in front of you, what type of food can you get? You can get two of these. You can't get all three. If you want cheap and fast, you can go to Taco Bell. Four dollars and four minutes, you can walk out. It's, it's fast, it's cheap. Is it good for you? Probably not. But it's fast and it's cheap. Now, if you want fast and good, you can go over to Panera. But it's going to cost you three to four times what it would have cost you at Taco Bell, right? So you can get fast and good. Now, you can get good and cheap. You go to a place, mom and pop's place, get yourself a good breakfast. But is it going to be fast? You gotta go, someone's got to go back and crack the eggs open and make your omelet. You can get good and cheap, but you can't, it won't be fast. You see how this works? You can pick two. You can have good, fast, good, cheap, fast, cheap, but you can't have good, fast, and cheap. In the same way, you can talk about God. I've heard this argument about when it comes to predestination and why do things happen and how does God control everything. You can have two of the three. God is good. God is all-powerful. And God is all-knowing. Pick two. Because if God is good, wants good for everyone, and God knows everything, God can't be all-powerful, or else why does evil happen? If God knows everything and is all-powerful, then God not, must not be good, because evil things happen. If God is good and all-powerful, then God must not know what's going to happen next, or else God would have done something differently. I remember when I first heard this, and I remember struggling with it, because it, it, it bothered me. Like, it either, reduce, it either makes God a jerk, God's all-powerful and all-knowing, but it's going to, so when evil things happen, it's because God doesn't want you to suffer. Or, God is clueless, right? God is all-powerful and good, but just doesn't, kind of bumbling, doesn't know what God's doing. Or God's a weenie. God knows what should happen, wants the good thing to happen, but can't make it happen. Right? This, this, this is why predestination gets under people's skin. It, it, it asks some hard questions. Now, you notice that there's something I haven't talked about yet in this sermon that you usually do talk about in a sermon. What have I not said anything about? The Bible, right? 
So if you're going to take, approach predestination, to talk, the first approach is to try to understand it very logically and coherently, just logic itself. And, and it leaves us in a very hard place. I, I think a better way to understand predestination is to, is to start to read Scripture and to read it closely. And to read it with this question. Who suffers most in Scripture? Who is the person in Scripture who suffers the most? It's not Job. Okay? God takes this people, this Hebrew people, and loves them out of slavery and brings them to the mountain. And Moses goes up the mountain and comes back down with the Ten Commandments. And God has given them one of the greatest gifts humanity has ever given. And what does God find them doing? Worshipping the golden calf. Right? And, and so then they go off into the desert, into the wilderness, so that they can learn how to be God's people. And, and what do they start doing? They whine. Right? They whine. They whine very specifically. I know, God, that you've made us free, but, but I wanted the garlic and the cucumbers from back in Egypt. And I love that we have the specificity. Like, this is a very, this is, these words came out of someone's mouth 3,000 years ago. But I wanted the garlic from Egypt, right? And, and so they're whining. And then they get to the promised land. And, and the people are going to be able to follow God and the land that is theirs. And, and they look at God and they say, we don't want you, we want a king. And then God gives them a king. And then they don't follow that king. And the king, other kings kind of lead them astray. And so God sends prophets to say to the people, be, I will be your God and you will be my people and it will go well for you. Just, just come back to me. And what's the batting average for prophets? It ain't high. The person who suffers most in Scripture is God. It is the suffering of a parent whose heart is stomped on by the children again and again and again. There is very little suffering that is as hard as the suffering of a parent who is being hurt by their child. And if we bring the, this, these, those three qualities again to a parent, good, um, knowing, and powerful, like if you think about how, how that works with a parent, a parent wants what is good for their child, always. A parent wants, their, wants the best for their child. A parent knows a lot more than the child. You really do need to get in the habit of picking up your dirty clothes. Like, this, this is a good thing, right? Don't yell when you don't get your way. Like, the parent knows these things that the child needs to learn. And a parent is all-powerful over what happens in that child's life. We're going to eat dinner now, and I don't care that the episode isn't done. There will be other episodes of My Little Pony. That might be something I've said, right? When it comes to thinking through being a parent, like... When we are parenting, it is not that God parents like us, it's that we parent like God. When we are at our finest being parents, we are reflecting who it is that God is as our Heavenly Father. And so we think about, as parents of children, what happens as children grow up. When it comes to these good, being uh, good, wanting what is good, being in control and having knowledge, power and knowledge, well, like what changes? A parent, even as a child grows up, a parent still wants what is best for their child, still wants the good, right? Parents still know more than their children, right? That, that, that doesn't change. What does change is the power, right? I have the ability to tell my children what to do. And as they grow up, I voluntarily choose to use that power less and less and less. Because to grow up is to be able to make a decision and have that decision count. Because if every time a child makes a decision, the parent insulates them from the consequences of that decision, do they grow up? No. And that's not good. 
Like if you want what is good for your child, and you know, good, all-knowing, all-powerful, to truly want to be good and have more knowledge and to be more powerful is to understand when to not use the power you have. To see God as a parent, as God is seen in Scripture, right, we, we see this when, when Paul is talking about how he's, he uses the word predestined. Pre, those are, in Romans 8, 29, predestination, and, and the term, the way it comes up in Scripture is that God has predestined those who follow Jesus to become like Jesus. And this is the same type of logic in which we tell our children. If you work hard, you will be someone who works hard. Duh. Right? If you work hard, you will be a, become a person with a good work ethic, and that's a good thing. If you follow Jesus, you will become like Jesus. Good. Right? This is a wonderful thing. What this means practically is that we can be assured that God is always involved in history, guiding and sustaining and leading towards the ultimate goal of the kingdom of God. That's the difference between us as parents and God as parents, is in the end, God will get God's way. The kingdom of God is going to come. Like, that's the given. As a parent, what we see in Scripture is that God knows, wants the best for all of us, so is good, knows everything, and is all-powerful, but doesn't use that power all the time because we need the space for our decisions to matter. God doesn't cause everything to happen so that our decisions count. And, and does God know what we're going to decide? Yes. In the same way that I know if I put, leave cookies out in the kitchen undefended, like, I know what's going to happen. I can still expect certain small children with the same last name to, to go in there. I mean, I expect them to go in there and want to make a run for the cookies. Like, we, we know what's going to happen. God knows what we're going to decide. And so when we come to predestination and we want to talk about this phrase, everything happens for a reason, I don't... I don't use that, that language anymore. I don't think it is wise because it turns God into a jerk. Everything happens for a reason means that, and if, if the reason is God's plan, that God wanted it to happen, means that God wanted you to suffer. And what parent wants their child to suffer? What I think we can say is that things happen for reasons and sometimes the reason is, is that someone else has made a horrible decision to text and drive and causes an accident, to, to uh, someone has denied God's plan, has made a decision that's very self-centered. There are reasons that horrible things happen, but they do not happen because God wanted them to happen. They happen because God has given God's children the ability to make decisions that matter. And then, like a parent with a child, what do you do with your child when your child suffers? You weep with them, right? You weep with them. And I think that's what we can say when it comes to talking about predestination. Things happen for reasons. Sometimes the reason is that a person made a horrible decision and God weeps with you in this moment. I think to read Scripture well, to read Scripture rightly, is to understand God the Father is a parent of all, who does what a parent can, weeps when children suffer, but unlike us, can guarantee the fate of our children. Who cannot guarantee the fate of our children, God can guarantee our fate in that the kingdom of God is going to come. Right? God's will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is why God the Father sent his only begotten Son so that all might be saved. That, in the end, is the destiny that we all share. We are heading towards the kingdom of God, being shepherded by a Father who loves us enough to let our decisions matter. Amen.